on today's World Insight with Chen Wei. Tell them to leave it. World leaders weigh in on the U.S. president's racially charged tweets. What's with the politics of race and gender? And a world in transition, a history professor talks about the future of geopolitics and capitalism. Here is our host, Xian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing. World leaders weigh in on racially charged remarks made by U.S. President Donald Trump. He doubled down on his tweets about four Democrat Congresswomen telling them they should go back to their countries of origin. The U.S. President's statements have been condemned as racist and xenophobic. That is not how we do things in Canada. A Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. It is totally unacceptable in a modern, uh, multiracial uh, country uh, which you're trying to lead. I hope I have made absolutely clear how totally offensive it is to me that people are still saying that kind of thing. U.S. allies means no words and comments on an attack by Mr. Trump against four Democrat congresswomen of color. After his Sunday tweet, Mr. Trump raised the rhetoric on race again, this time in front of the cameras. These are people that, in my opinion, hate our country. Now, you can say what you want, but get a list of all of the statements they've made. And all I'm saying is that if they're not happy here, they can leave. They can leave, and you know what? I'm, I'm sure that there'll be many people that won't miss them. But they have to love, they have to love our country they're Congress people. Meanwhile, Democrats held a vote in the House of Representatives condemning the president for his racially charged tweet. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Mr. Trump has succeeded in uniting his political opponents. The targets of his attacks are not about to back down. He relies on racism, division, and anti-immigrant sentiment to consolidate power because he does not have a positive vision for the future of America. It indeed all boils down to a vision for the future of America, whether the nation is one of multiracial and multicultural roots. So is it about race? gender, ethnicity, or politics? Mr. Trump's strategy to wire up his political base? Let's turn to our panelists. Uh, joining us from Washington, D.C., Eleanor Clift, a political analyst of the Daily Beast. Welcome to our program, ma'am. In Tampa, we invited Brandon Thank Andrews, you. an entrepreneur and former Hill staffer. He is a uh, a party member of the Republican Party, and certainly. And in Iowa City, we have Tim C. Hagel, professor of political science at the University of Iowa. Welcome to the three of you. Let me go to you first, Ms. Clift. As a woman, how do you see the remarks made by your president? Uh, I think the president is trying to stoke anger among the American people about the changing face of America. Uh, women are coming into their own in terms of power. Uh, brown people and black people are t getting uh, uh, positions of power in the society. And there's a segment of, of the country that is uh, very anxious about what they see as the changing nature of this country. And mm. he is appealing to that in the most base way. And he is doing it for uh, political reasons because he cannot win a majority in this country, but he needs to turn out every vote that he can. He won uh, with only 43 percent of the vote in 2016, right. and he hopes to duplicate that really high wire act again in 2020. And uh, he has basically stoked a lot of racial and gender anxiety in I the see. country. Mr. Andrews, is it about politics? It's about the election at the end of the day. Well, Benjamin Franklin said it's the first, uh, the, the first goal of every American citizen is to question authority, and uh, questioning authority, being critical of government, has been something that President Trump has done as well. Uh, the way in which he's approached these women um, is not appropriate. Uh, however, I think he's trying to articulate a broader concern that 
criticism be solutions focused and that whether you are an average American citizen or a member of Congress um, that you work towards building a better America. Um, he certainly uh, was inappropriate with the comments but uh, I think there are a lot of people to uh, the other guests uh, point um, that would agree that uh, some of the comments that these uh, members of Congress have made um, are offensive uh, and they want to make sure that if you're here working uh, towards uh, building a better America um, that you are uh, actually working on, uh, on keeping it positive as, as much as possible. Interesting. Professor Hegel, uh, what about your take now? The Republican Party is, as a party, almost all of them are standing together with President Trump. Now, how do you see this phenomenon? Does it mean the party subscribe to the ideology President Trump mentioned in his earlier tweets about these four Congresswomen? Right. As far as the Republican Party is concerned, that certainly they've become known to criticism too because they haven't attacked President Trump. And they're in a tough position to a certain extent. They may not agree with the things, some of the things that President Trump says or the way he goes about uh, achieving his policies. But in terms of the alternative, especially when you look back in 2016, that uh, they really didn't have a whole lot of choice in terms of what to do. Uh, that uh, Hillary Clinton at the time as the nominee for the Democrats was going to have policies that they certainly opposed. So uh, they went for the most part with uh, President Trump. Not everybody did, of course. There were some alternatives. So we still have to see what happens in 2020, who the Democrats nominate. There will probably be some Republican defections there there as well, but pretty much any Democrat that's nominated is going to have policies that generally Republicans aren't going to agree with, so they're back to that essential choice of saying, well, whose policies do we agree with, even if we don't necessarily approve uh, all the time of the way that they are uh, articulated by President Trump? Ms. Clift, here's the issue. Political differences exist um, among parties. That's just a thing of nature. However, does it mean these differences will exist without the bottom line? For example, about some of the basic values, at least according to the American Constitution, it still exists. Well, uh, President Trump has basically taken over the Republican Party, and the Republican Party once stood for uh, immigration. It stood for free trade. Uh, it has a proud history when it comes to uh, inclusion in, in, this, in this country. He has turned all those values on their side, and the Republicans are now staying with him because they have no alternative. He has turned the party into his party, a party of people who will shout, send her back, or lock her up at rallies. The kind of uh, chance that really uh, make your blood run cold when you when you watch it because of the historical analogies mm. that you have to draw uh, and so uh, the Republicans are basically sticking with this president because they want to win re-election and they've got it they, they're depending on his voters if they defect he will call them names and uh, call them out and they will lose whatever support they had so the question is uh, does Trumpism whatever it is uh, outlive President Trump. He's not going to be president forever, even yeah. if he manages to win uh, re-election. That's an eligible question, isn't it, Professor Hegel? As a political science professor, I'm sure you've been thinking about that. Right. Uh, one of the things, of course, we know is that parties change over time. Uh, Republicans generally still do favor immigration. What the concern right now has to do with is illegal immigration and how to solve it. And as far as the party becoming the party of Trump, well, at the time there was the party of Reagan. And at the time that Ronald Reagan was president, the Republicans were criticized then, too. So criticism of Republicans is nothing new. And to a certain extent, every party has to take on but certain Professor aspects Hegel, I have to remind you always, and also the audience who are watching our debate right now, which is it is not about the, co the policies of the Republican Party. That's another thing. What people, <laughs> as we mentioned in our background, are world leaders from even allied countries of the United States being reacting to the specific 
tweet made by your president toward these four Congress women, which is asking them to go back to their own country. And he was using a language which I would not want to repeat in this program. Now, of course, that's your internal matter. It's your internal politics. But the world also have to pay attention to this because the United States is the biggest country in the world. And the example, or lack of example, is set could be in repercussions around the world. So that's the kind of framework I'm asking my question. I'm not asking about the Republican Party. I'm just asking what is this statement about and what does it say about the bottom line of U.S. election politics these days? Is it without principle or still have some principles? Professor, please directly answer. Thank you. Well, it's 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 hard to distinguish between President Trump and the Republican Party because as we already heard that the, there's an attempt to say well if President Trump does this it must mean that Republicans do that as well but to, to answer your question it does make it somewhat difficult we've seen this with other things that Trump has said regarding uh, statements uh, having to do with our allies of various sorts and whether this is causing some tension and various things that Trump has tried to do so in this sense it's not unusual even if this particular situation is causing more of a firestorm. Mm. Mr. Andrews, uh, from even the party politics perspective, are there other lines that a candidate from the Republican Party could follow in order to win voters? Uh, we see the strategy being used in the last election, willingly really push things to the extreme. Now, what would that mean for the Republican Party politics for the future uh, in the next four years and probably even eight or 16 years. Mr. Andrews. Sure, well, yeah, Professor Hagel said that it's difficult for these Republican members of Congress to call out the president. I don't think it's difficult at all to say that something is sexist or racist or to say that the president is in comments were inappropriate. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt said uh, it is morally reprehensible for American citizens to not criticize the president. And so in thinking about where the party is going, in the future, I think you follow the example of members of Congress like Will Hurd, who is the only uh, Republican member, uh, African American uh, Republican uh, member, but uh, but also uh, the only um, member to represent uh, a district that is on the border. When you talk about immigration, um, he hasn't been shy about one um, calling out some of the issues with. Uh, some of the immigration uh, reforms on the Democratic, coming from the Democratic side, but mm -hmm. he definitely hasn't been shy at, at all about calling out President Trump when he has said things or done things that don't align with American values or said things that were racist or sexist. And so I say to other members of the Republican Farley Party, follow Will Hurd's example, and that will lead us, I think, to a greater uh, a greater base uh, in, of people to, to build the party and also uh -huh. lead to, uh, when you talk about America's political discourse, a, mo a, a much more positive place. And so there is another <coughs> path, there is another line to follow I see. Um, that doesn't include, uh, unfortunately, the, the path that President Trump is, has led us down so far. Just to be fair here, because I don't want, want to, as a media outside the United States want to meddle into your internal affairs, but so that I have to be fair here and ask you, Ms. Clift, about these uh, four Congresswomen and the response from the Democrat Party, uh, whether there has been opportunities or occasions in which politicians also jump on this issue and take advantage of that for the election result. How do you see this very serious issue about race, about equality, about gender uh, being uh, repeatedly used politically in leading up to the election season, Ms. Clift? Is that a good uh, well, way of making sure things will be done fairly or people will have a fatigue eventually about this issue and the fairness will just be gone? Well, the, the, the president uh, reportedly thinks that he's doing a good job because he is marrying the four freshman members of Congress with the Speaker of the House 
and making these four women the face of the Democratic Party, when in fact they represent four uh, very uh, Democratic districts, districts that haven't elected a Republican in a hundred years, and the Democrats owe their majority in the House to 42 Democrats who won in districts that were previously held by Republicans. So they do not represent the broad face of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is not uh, going socialist or mm. communist, as some Republicans would like to say. Uh, and in fact, the, the president's strategy is a sh short-term strategy. It may be riling up his base now. He's also riling up people who oppose him. And there are more of what he might term others in this country than there are in his uh, base. The Republican Party, the freshman Democratic class elected uh, last year, had only one woman. Uh, there are the lowest number of women in the House elected by Republicans that have in, in a quarter of a century. Uh, this is a multicultural country. We have the Statue of Liberty in our harbor. Uh, that is the future of the country, and okay. the Republicans are, are going to have a hard time outrunning the statistics and the demographics. Professor Hegel, I've been hearing a lot of words like tactics, strategies, ways of doing things during our discussion over the past 10 minutes. Uh, very few mentioning the word values and principles and cores. Uh, how uh, should I understand this? Uh, I mean, right now, all the debates going on in your country is it framed by elections only, whether it's you know, politics within the country or uh, foreign relations issue, it's all sh shaped by the election. What does that mean for uh, America's serious choice of its own future? Should things be done in this way? Unfortunately, of course, we know the nature of the elections, but still we have to ask that question. It's always difficult to find what issues are going to drive voters to the polls. And unfortunately, what we've seen in the past several elections is that a lot of negativity tends to get people to the polls more than positivity or positive things. So although you do have a number of people that try to talk about values, if you watch, for example, or, or did watch the last uh, Democratic presidential debates, you a did bit. have a number of candidates at various times try to talk about values. But on the other hand, and even some what we call kitchen table issues, jobs, economy, health care, mm -hmm. but it's often these things that drive the media narrative, things like President Trump's tweet and the reaction to it, that take center stage. And that's unfortunate, but it's a reality that we live in today. Mm. Mr. Andrews, it's a very serious question Professor Hegel just raised. Therefore, really the question is, does eyeballs equal to ballots? Have we seen that being a successful tactic over the past elections? If that were the case, what does it mean for the nature of your election? I'm not here to attack any country's election system. I'm just asking you as a very intellectual question. Well, creating these viral moments, whether they're because of something positive the president has said or because of something negative the president has said, does, to your point, get more eyeballs on his campaign uh, and does drive more excitement in the base. Uh, but unfortunately for the Republican Party, they're going to run out of eyeballs that are actually interested in hearing some of these sexist and racist things from the president if as demographics continue uh, to change and become more diverse in the country. And so, yes, it is a election strategy that worked in 2016 and that uh, is continuing to uh, allow the Republican Party to raise funds at a really significant rate. However, at some point, the eyeballs, again, to use your term of art, will run out uh, and there just won't be enough people interested in hearing this kind of thing. And at that point, the question for the party will be, Will you mm. stop uh, making these statements? Will you stop doing these things? Um, will you go back to claiming that mantle of being the party of Lincoln uh, and actually building a broad base uh, and ensuring that everyone, no matter where they come from, mm. no matter what their race is, sex, gender, etc., um, feels comfortable 
uh, voting for a Republican, uh, whether it's down the ballot or, or even for president. Okay, Ms. Cliff, do you buy that idea just mm -hmm. uh, mentioned by Mr. Uh, Andrews? Uh, what about from now until the day uh, when that change happens, as mentioned in the answer of Mr. Andrews? Well, I would argue that uh, values and what this country stands for is at the core of the uh, democratic opposition and the Democratic candidates, mm -hmm. and there are some two dozen of them, uh, are making it a centerpiece of their campaigns. Former Vice President Joe Biden uh, basically entered the campaign talking about the incident that happened in Charlottesville where you had uh, uh, really Nazi uh, sympathizers marching and, uh, and one woman was killed and the President said, well, there are good people on both sides. So he made that the centerpiece of his opening announcement into the campaign. Wow. Cory Booker, another of the candidates, a senator, basically is talking about uh, bringing a civic gospel into, uh, in, in, into politics, into public service. So I think it's very much at the heart of the case against, against this president, and I think you're going to hear you know, more conversation about that. But race has always been an undercurrent in this country. The, uh, the original sin was slavery, uh, which uh, we are still uh, uh, trying know, to grapple uh, with. Paying for in, in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. You're trying to grapple with would be a, way, a better way to say it. You know, some people are arguing that the conversation that has erupted now is, uh, you know, could be positive that we're getting things, we're airing things out. but. You know, I worry that it's uh, it's too hate-filled to be to be yeah. productive. But this is something that we're that we're that we're struggling through, and that politicians, as they will always do, will uh, take take advantage of it in in ways that are both positive and hate, negative. Hate, anger, anxieties. These have been so much used in the election season. We probably have to put the party politics a bit aside and talk about the bigger picture uh, because the reason why we are discussing this issue is not because we are voters in the United States, but rather exactly the other way around because we are watching from outside what the U.S. is doing and where is it heading for and how uh, logics within the country are dominating the U.S. logics of dealing with others uh, as well, whether it's allies or not. So, uh, Professor Hegel, I want to go to you about that. As a political science professor, how do you see the spillover effect in the way the issues within the country have such a huge impact on the uh, anxieties that the U.S. is dealing with on so many different fronts, whether with allies or not, around the world. How do you see that spillover effect? Is there a way that can be contained so that we can still be sustainable on many fronts? That's a very good question. Uh, we certainly have seen what in this country has been called uh, Trump's a populist, and you know other people would disagree with that particular uh, tag, but we've seen a similar uh, movements in other countries where there's been a reaction, whether it's been to immigration in other countries or other problems, and populist candidates have sort of taken control in various ways, sometimes to the good, sometimes to less so. And to a certain extent, you could argue that that's a bit of a spillover to what we're seeing here in the United States. Again, it plays out differently in each country depending on that country's issues, but certainly you see that, that occurring. The question, of course, is, and getting to the question of sustainability, yeah. what's going to happen long term? And we just don't know at this point. To some extent, we're waiting to see what's going to happen here. If uh, a Democrat is elected president in the United States in 2020, will that cause a sea change or will the tensions continue? We don't know. And of course, if President Trump is reelected, Elected. Will we have just four more years of this? Will things become worse? Will they settle down? And again, it's really hard to say, and it's yeah. hard to say at this point what's going to happen long term in the other countries as well. Very interesting to talk about that. Ms. Cliff, to go to you also. I mean, the reason why the United States, what it's doing internally, would uh, in a way have an indirect impact on the others is because the U.S. is still the largest economy in the world. And the U.S. is playing a huge and mm -hmm. uh, instrumental and usually important role in international organizations as well as international mechanisms. Uh, even though in recent years there have been the lack of uh, support about uh, multilateralism from Washington right now, but still, you know what the U.S. is doing. The 
mentality of the United States and how the logic is evolving inside the U.S. politics would have this spillover effect to the other issues. Ms. Clift, uh, now the rest of the world, as you heard from the very beginning of our show, are genuinely very concerned about the current stage. As intellectual in your country as well, how do you see where you are and, and how would you be able to lessen the concern of the others? Of course, you are not running for the president, but I have to put that question to you since you, the three of you are talking to me right now. Uh, well, uh, this country uh, has been seen as a beacon of, of light and freedom seen throughout the world. It's one of the reasons why we have so many scrambling to try to get into this country through our southern border coming from countries in C Central America that where they are experiencing so much crime and poverty. I mean, this has been the, the safe harbor for generations of, of people from around the world. I mean, I'm the daughter of immigrants. I mean, everybody here except for the Native Americans are from somewhere else. So um, this is the heart and soul of, of, who, of who we are. And the presidents uh, came into office talking about American carnage and really uh, talking about all the negative sides of, of American life and then saying he, he, would, he would be America first and he was, uh, didn't trust any of these international uh, deals. And what you're seeing it playing out again on the campaign trail is a heightened concern about uh, climate change, uh, which was an issue that has mm. been sort of s swept under the rug for the recent campaign cycles. You have every, every Democrat and at least one Democratic uh, contender running solely on the promise to really uh, face this issue head on. Uh, and you hear a lot of complaints in this country, particularly from Republicans, that climate change isn't real, it's a hoax, okay. and besides, other countries like India and China aren't doing their part, so why should we change our, our behavior? America needs to lead, and this is, this is something that threatens the planet. And so, yes, American leadership okay. and how it's been eroded under this president will, willingly is very much of a concern to many of us citizens. But you know, uh, Mr. Andrews, it, it's not about just the one president. Uh, one, <coughs> the credibility is being questioned, which is the case right now about the United States on many issues, trade, politics, uh, international relations, uh, in interaction with the international organizations, international treaties. Once these are becoming questionable, will the U.S. still be able to lead uh, as the U.S. would like to see, quote unquote, uh, Mr. Andrews, your point? Yes, the U.S. is still looked to lead around the world. I was just at the Global Entrepreneurship Summit uh, that was held at The Hague in the Netherlands, and entrepreneurs from around the world, to, to include myself, uh, were brought there by the U.S. State Department to talk about ways we could build relationships and build business together. And everyone there certainly looked to the United States as a global leader in convening these types of meetings uh, just because there's been a movement to uh, pull back from some of those international agreements uh, in, the, in the past couple of years doesn't mean that the U.S. is ceding uh, leadership, in the, in leader, leadership globally uh, to anyone else. The, the U.S. is certainly still a leader, uh, but there's more things that the U.S. can certainly be doing. Um, the United Nations declared uh, the, the next decade, 2015 through 2024, as the decade for people of African descent. Then the United States has yet to uh, create a official recognition mm -hmm. uh, of that decade. And um, that's something that the U.S. could do that could be very easily done and something that could turn these comments by President Trump on his head. Uh, and speaking of entrepreneurship, there are entrepreneurs in the United States, um, African Americans okay. who have a company called Black and Abroad who have taken this go back to Africa hashtag that's been used in a negative way online and taken it and used it to create positive uh, images of folks traveling around the continent of Africa. Which, uh, 
So all of us should be connecting globally, and all of us should definitely want to make sure that uh, the U.S. continues to stay, stay in the leadership position. There has yes. always been the question, isn't it, Professor Hagel, that the world has been changing so much and so fast, technological-wise, geopolitical-wise. It's not about the people that could not catch up with the trend. It's really about governance that could not catch up with the trend. Now, uh, what we are seeing right now in the United States, is it an effort trying to catch up with the trend, the real trend of the world? Or is it an effort to withdraw from the real trend in the world by concealing the eyes and say, I can't see, Professor Hagel? Another good question. Uh, it's always sometimes hard in the moment to determine whether you're ahead of the curve or behind the curve at yeah. any particular point. And sometimes we just have to wait until after the fact, until we see how history develops to find out whether, again, you were ahead or behind. And so right now, again, we're in this moment, and at least here in the United States, we're so closely focused on what President Trump is doing and these sorts of things that perhaps many of us lose the bigger point, the, mm -hmm. the global point, in terms of how things are changing, particularly with the Internet and, and social media, how this I is see. affecting other countries and how this is affecting governance. We do have some... Uh, inclination of this when the Congress is holding hearings dealing with Facebook and Google and how that's going to affect governance and campaigns and all of this. So again, it's one of these, these stories that's yet to be written. Tim C. Hagel, Eleanor Clift, Brendan Andrews, really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you for helping us to understand what's going on in your country from your perspective and also your insights about what that means to us, the rest of the world. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And you're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. Still to come on our live program. A world in transition. A history professor from the United States talk about the future of geopolitics and what he said, capitalism. That interview right after this break. Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside coming to you live from Beijing. After China and the U.S. resume to resume trade talks, negotiations are now stuck in limbo, as some believe, with U.S. President Donald Trump again threatening to impose more tariffs. On Tuesday, China warned new tariffs would derail progress towards reaching a deal. The brewing trade war has been cast as a clash between a protectionist unilateral approach and a multilateral system that works for everyone, which China has long advocated. In other words, will it be the law of the jungle where the strong pounce on the others or a rules-based order where everyone gets a fair shake, at least in their eyes. That's what I asked Dr. Jerry Muller, a professor of history at the Catholic University of America. Here is his perspective. Now, uh, with the geopolitics and the potential geopolitic conflicts, people worried from anywhere in the world whether there's likely to be a Cold War. What do you think? Well, it's not a matter of pure, it's not a matter of purely capitalist societies versus communist societies, socialist societies, as as was the case uh, with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The United States traditionally has uh, has been a champion of free trade within the country and free trade between countries, above all since the Second World War. But now, in the case of China it's faced with a uh, new kind of system. So I'm worried about, um, I think the exchange, the, the greater involvement in recent decades of China in the world capitalist economy and in trading with the United States has had a lot of benefits for both countries. Also, the exchange of people the exchange of students and so on has had a lot of benefits, uh, and I'm concerned that there will be a, that there could be a diminution of each of those. But a good deal of it depends on American leadership, but a good deal of it depends on Chinese leadership too. 
I have to point out that it's not the tension between the United States and China that's the problem right now, but also the tension between the United States and the European Union, between the United States and Japan, between the United States and South Korea, between the United States and Vietnam, between the United States and also some of the other countries as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have a president in the United States who is um, skeptical uh, of a lot of the premises of free trade. Uh, to, to a considerable degree... Is the president making all the decisions for the United States of America? Uh, in, in one way or another, um, he does. He, you know, he, cho he chooses who his negotiators are going to be, his cabinet is going to be, and so on. Uh, so there are two things to be said about it. Let me say both. On the one hand, he tends to underrate the value of free trade. On the other hand, there are real issues that have bothered uh, American observers of international economic relations, uh, above all in regard to China, of the kinds that I've already expressed, that are uh, felt uh, well beyond President Trump. So one can be skeptical of his mindset and of his leadership style, and I am indeed skeptical of both of those, and still recognize that he has called attention to some real tangible issues of tension between uh, the United States and China in regard to economic issues. One of the issues people are worried about mm -hmm. is whether the trade negotiations have become a negotiation or a talk of whether you become us mm -hmm. or you're bad. Mm -hmm. And also the World Trade Organization discussion and reform, mm -hmm. whether it will become whether it is our rules mm -hmm. or we quit, there's no rules. Mm -hmm. What do you make of this debate? Does capitalism give the space of diversity of other societies to exist? Or capitalism in nature only allows itself to flourish? Whether it's doing a good job or not, that's another question and no other possibilities, Professor? Capitalism is not one thing, right? There are uh, various societies, including various primarily capitalist societies, have different styles of capitalism in the present and certainly have had different styles of capitalism in the past. So it isn't capitalism in itself that is determinative. Uh, you know, we're so in other words, you are saying diversity even exists within capitalism societies themselves? Of course it does, yes. It's part of the nature of capitalism, as its most astute observers have pointed out, uh, including Karl Marx, but also uh, Joseph Schumpeter, that capitalism is a dynamic process. It changes over time. Mm -hmm. And with those changes come relative winners, and relative losers because it's based on uh, innovation. And innovation, technological innovation, organizational innovation, uh, innovation means that some of the older ways of producing things are no longer economical. And that means that some people's way of life and way of earning a living becomes uh, less valuable in the marketplace or doesn't have any value at all in the marketplace. And one of the things, of course, that we've seen in recent decades is that partly because of technological changes, but also because of um, the globaliza globalization of investment and, and labor, uh, that is to say, the outsourcing from the point of view of the United States mm -hmm. of a lot of manufacturing to China, uh, that has had some tremendous advantages for American consumers. It's also meant that there are substantial parts of the American sort of industrial manufacturing working class that have been left behind. Now, sometimes they've been left behind because of, as I say, this globalization of trade. More often, it's because of technology. It's easier to point to trade as the source than technology. Uh, but that's part of the dynamism of capitalism and the uh, the, uh, the challenge of democratic capitalist societies 
is to uh, try to alleviate the uh, disadvantages mm -hmm. while maintaining the advantages. So, this is, so alleviating disadvantages in part by trying to re-educate people for other skills, right. also by part, partly by providing um, income support and so on. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's an ongoing challenge, uh, but it's not insurmountable. Yeah. An American historian talking about the current issue about trade and politics. With that, we are coming to the end of today's uh, discussion. But tune in tomorrow on World Inside. We'll bring you our special program on the 50th anniversary of the historic moon landing of the Apollo 11. That is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Inside CGTN, into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for more insights across China and Asia.